according to this problem at a certain place on railway track the radius of curvature of the railway track has been given to you as 200 meter given that at that place the distance between the rails is 1.6 meter and the outer rail is raised by 0.08 meter above the inner rail you have to find out the speed of the train such that there is no side pressure on the rails assuming the value of g as 10 meter per second square you have to choose the right option out of these given options so it is going to look something like this now if there is no side pressure then the friction force is going to be zero right and the component of the normal reaction acting towards the center of this circle is going to provide the necessary centripetal force to this train so obviously the train is going to move in a circle and some force has to provide the centripetal force agreed and who is going to do that n sine theta where you can see that theta is this angle and according to the problem statement the distance ab which is the distance between the two rails is 1.6 meter right the value of h is given to you as 0 0.08 meter so let's form the equations in the perpendicular direction the net force on the train is going to be zero right which means that n cos theta is m into g where m obviously is the mass of this train and in the horizontal direction n sine theta will be equal to m v square by r make sense right and from this we can also see that the value of sine theta from here which is perpendicular by hypotenuse is 0 0.08 divided by 1.6 which is 1 by 20 and the value of sine theta is pretty small right so you can approximate it to theta which further you can approximate to tan theta remember how the approximation works for smaller angles right and why am i finding the value of tan theta because i am planning to perform the operation 1 by 2 which is this and the n is going to get cancelled out and on the left hand side i will have tan theta and that is why i want to find what is tan theta so tan theta here is going to be equal to v square by r into g and tan theta is 1 by 20. so let's move on to an empty empty slide to solve this so 1 by 20 is v square divided by r is 200 and g is 10. and you get the value of v as 10 meter per second and this is your right answer so in this case you can take option b as the right option for this simple but conceptual problem now this problem talks about a car which has a mass of 500 kg and it is moving unidirectionally or you can say in the same direction with a velocity of 36 km per hour and it has been mentioned that in one minute the velocity becomes double you have to find out what is the power delivered by its engine and then choose the right option so the car goes from moving with 36 km per hour to 72 km per hour in 60 seconds so let's assume that all the power delivered by the engine goes into increasing the kinetic energy of this car all right so to find out the power we have to find the work done because power is defined as the rate at which the work has been done correct so everything boils down to finding out how much work has been done and how will you do that how will you find the value of w 
Well, we can use the work energy theorem. Remember, the work done is going to be equal to the change in kinetic energy. So, the initial velocity is 36 km per hour and let's convert it into meter per second because as you, can, as you can see in the options, all the options are in watt, right? So we want it in SI units. To do that, we can multiply it with a conversion factor of 5 by 18. So this is nothing but 10 meter per second. So the car goes from moving with a speed of 10 meter per second to 20 meter per second in 60 second. So what is the work done? This is the final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy. And this is half into m. This can be common. Vf square minus Vi square. So 400 minus 100. Right? And this is in joules. And to find out power, we can divide it with 60. Right? So this is 25 into 300 divided by 6, which is nothing but 1250 watt. So this is the answer that we are trying to seek. And you can pick option D as the right option. Now in a hydraulic lift, compressed air exerts a force F1 on the smaller piston whose radius is 5 cm. Now this pressure is transmitted to the second piston which obviously has the larger area and you can see the radius of this piston is 15 cm. If the mass of the load to be lifted is 1350 kg, you have to find out the pressure acting on the smaller piston. So the setup looks something like this. And now I want you to recall the Pascal's law, according to which the pressure is transmitted undiminished throughout the fluid, right? So the excess pressure at this point must be equal to the excess pressure at this point. And what is the excess pressure here? It is F1 by A1. And the excess pressure here is F2 by A2. So we have F1 by A1, which is P1 that we want to find to be equal to F2 by A2. Now we know that the value of A2 is going to be pi R2 square. But what is F2? So there is a load, right? And F2 must be equal to M into G. So let's put the values. F2 is 1350 into 10, that is 13500 divided by, and we want the pressure to be in Pascal. So we have to put the area in the SI unit. All right. So this is going to be pi 15 into 10 raised to the power minus 2 square. And this will come out to be in Newton per meter square, or we can say Pascal. And when you simplify this, then you're going to get the value of P1 to be approximately 1.9 into 10 raised to the power 5 Pascal. And you can see that this is greater than the atmospheric pressure. So there you go. In this case, the value of the pressure acting on the smaller piston is going to be 1.9 into 10 raised to the power 5 Pascal. So two particles are executing simple harmonic motion. The first one has the angular frequency omega and the second one has an angular frequency 2 omega. You have to tell which of the following graphs which are plotted between A and X correctly represent the SHM of these two particles. So for particle 1, let's say it's acceleration A1. This is going to be minus omega square X. And for particle 2, A2 is going to be minus 4 omega square x. So for both the particles, the acceleration varies linearly with x. Right? And can you see for both of them, when x is 0, then acceleration is also 0. So A versus x graph for both the particles will be a straight line passing through 
origin and by this logic you can discard option a and option d so out of options b and c one is going to be right and which one is going to be the right graph for that let's put some negative value of x let's say x is equal to minus 1 for x is equal to minus 1, a1 is going to be omega square, whereas a2 will be 4 omega square. So clearly a2 is greater than a1, and that is correctly represented by the graph given in option C. So you can see that for any negative value of x, a2 is greater than a1. Right? So from here, you can tick option C as the right option. Now, according to this problem, motion of air near a seashore when wind is blowing is. Now, if you ever been to a beach, you would have felt a nice soothing breeze on your face, right? Now, it's a no-brainer that you feel that because the air molecules are getting transferred from one place to the other and you happen to be in their way. Now, recall that in the case of wave, the particles of the medium do not get transferred from one place to the other, right? They only oscillate about their mean position, either to and fro or in a direction perpendicular to the direction of propagation of a wave. But in this case, when the wind blows, then the air molecules are moving from one place to the other, which means that obviously this is not a wave. Right? So it's a no-brainer. And in this case, you can quickly select option D as the right option. 